welcome to VAM. My name is Jennifer Gerillo and I'm a professor of English at Mesa College. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We're so glad you're here somewhere out there. We know you're there. Um, and we're just really excited for you to hear all of these amazing stories. Hi, and I'm Bianca. Uh, in 2018, I interned for So Say We All. And that same year, I was also co-producer of Mesa College Showcase. I love the experience I had at VAMP as it allowed me to be part of San Diego's literary and performing arts community. Co-producing this event also helped me learn how much work and how many people it takes to put together a show. This past year, we've spent a lot of time alone. During this time of solitude, we were called to reflect on our past experiences. The following stories you are about to hear tonight are the products of reflection on the theme of catapult. Sometimes we have to be thrown into a difficult situation to find our true character. As uncomfortable as these situations are, they are necessary for our growth. Well said, Bianca. Um, our performers for tonight who are going to let you into their world of catapulting, we have Charlotte Liu, Joey Cruz, Jimmy Willie, Bardia Musabi, Keila Penny, and Matt Remington. And put your hands together for our very first reader, Jimmy Willie. I lifted my head and looked around the dimly lit room to see the other neighborhood kids sleeping soundly, chests rising and falling with deep snuffles and snores. The noise of my legs rubbing in the silky fabric of the sleeping bag sounded loud in my ears as I climbed out of the bottom bunk, my bare feet silent as they landed on the icy wood floor. I tugged down the Holly Hobby nightgown haphazardly twisted up around my waist and saw the faint sparks of static electricity as the rough, itchy fabric rubbed against itself. I held my breath as I tiptoed toward the bedroom door, so afraid to wake the babysitter Belinda and have her make me go back to bed. I didn't want to go back to bed. I wanted to go home. I crept down the hall and up the stairs to the landing at the front door and slid the deadbolt back, wincing as the clicks seemed to echo in the empty hallway. I inched the door open, gritting my teeth in anticipation of a squeak, but it remained blessedly silent. With a last furtive look over my shoulder, I slithered soundlessly out the front door, pulling it gently closed behind me, cheering myself for mastering the art of the silent escape. I bounded down the front steps quick as a sprite and barreled out into the darkness, one part excited to go home and another part anxious about all the creepy things potentially hiding in the dark. It was a short, straight shot between my house and the babysitter, but in the fathomless darkness of the middle of the night, the journey felt ominous and endless. I scampered as quickly as my six-year-old legs could carry me across the front yard, with only the bright light from the summer moon and twinkling stars to guide me. The soft dirt beneath my feet felt cool and damp, and my toes would dig in involuntarily each time I, the sharp poke of a rock hit beneath my bare soles. It never occurred to me that the door might be locked, being in the middle of the night, after all, and luckily it never occurred to my mother to actually lock the door, not in our small town. With much less care than I exercised escaping the house next door, I skipped up the small step and burst through the front door to the welcoming arms of my home. Immediately enveloped in the warmth that came with the comfort of my own house, my anxiety lessened a little. The living room lights cast an amber glow on the walls, and I smiled at the familiar shadows. I meandered down the hallway toward Mom's room, fingers trailing lightly on the wall. Having pulled this sneaky run-home-in-the-middle-of-the-night routine numerous times before, I figured she'd still be awake. She worked as a bartender at the BFW in town and always stayed up super late. Finding Mom face down on the bed, her room dark, caught me by surprise. I stood in the doorway, listening intently to try and determine if she was asleep already. Usually I would just crawl up next to her in the big bed if she were awake, but if she were asleep, I wasn't sure if I'd be welcome. Sometimes she felt a little grumpy if I woke her up after a night at the bar. Running dummy, they called her at work. Another stereotypical drunk Indian. I nod at my bottom lip, not sure what to do. Take my chances in bed with Mama or climb into my own bed alone. I was so wrapped up in my own head that I didn't notice the noises at first. I heard a soft sniffle and a sigh. Mama? When I got no response, I whispered again more urgently. Mama? I could tell when she heard me, her whole body jerked with awareness. Jimmer? Her voice slurred as she muttered my nickname. I'm here, Mama. Are you okay? She didn't sound right. I had no idea how I knew that, but my gut clenched tight as a fist beneath my ribs. 
She raised her arm in the dark, and it appeared like a ghostly silhouette beckoning me over. Tentatively, I shoved toward the bed, wrapping my arms around myself as a sudden chill replaced the warm comfort I'd felt since walking in the front door. She sniffled as I approached the bed, and though I couldn't see her face clearly in the darkness of the room, she was obviously crying. Her short brown hair looked must, and the soft curls she teased into it so carefully each morning had fallen flat as she lay facing the center of the bed, curled into a little ball, small and strangely childlike. She reeked of cigarettes and sweat and stale perfume. I reached out a hand and touched her disheveled hair, pushing it away from her damp forehead, mimicking the comforting gesture that she would do for me when my own tears would fall. It was a seamless easing into the role of mother, of caretaker, having learned everything from her. Mama, are you okay? Butch and I had a fight, and now he won't come home. She choked back a sob, and I felt despair rolling off her as another wave of fresh tears began to fall. She was truly distraught, and it scared the hell out of me. My heart began to beat frantically in my chest, a manic thud pulsing in my ears like a drum. The youngest of a whole passel of siblings, this was the first time I was truly alone with Mama. My closest older brother and sister were gone for the summer, and the others were grown, lived away from home with children of their own. Freshly divorced from husband number four, Mama spent a lot of time at the bar for both work and for play, and I spent a lot of time with the babysitter next door. Butch was one in a long line of boyfriends Mama was trying on like fresh socks since Pops had left. He treated me nicely and didn't seem to mind having a little kid around, where the others either yelled at me to get lost or just pretended like I didn't exist. So while I wasn't really attached to this guy, I saw Mama liked him a lot and he was the best one so far, so I realized I really needed to fix this, to fix her. Do you want me to call him, Mama? I'll call him if you want me to. I wiped the hair away from her face again, feeling the dampness of tears on her papery skin. She turned her face toward me. The pungent scent of alcohol on her breath when she spoke was overwhelming. Would you? Would you ask him to come home? My heart ached at the look of grief in her eyes. Of course, I would do anything for her. I turned to the beige phone on the nightstand and wrapped my small hand around the heavy receiver. As my chubby finger pulled back and let go of each number, the rotary dial on the phone pulsed back into place to a soft little click. When the man answered on the other end of the line, I told him my name that I needed to find Butch. I didn't understand how odd it was that the man who answered not only recognized me, but didn't question why a six-year-old was calling the bar at 1 a.m. asking for a man that everybody knew wasn't her father. He told me to hold on for a moment and set the phone down. The faint electrical hum of the phone mixed with the murmur of voices and the twang of honky-tonk music on the jukebox in the background loud in my ear. Absent-mindedly, I began to coil the phone cord around my finger, waiting nervously for him to pick up the line. Hello. His voice was gravelly, and it was curt with anger and alcohol. Um, Butch, it's, it's Jimmy. Mom's crying, and she's really sad. She said you had a fight. Well, shit. He sighed, and I felt the tension in his voice through the phone. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly. You okay, Jimmy Cricket? His voice softened and he called me that. It was a nickname he'd given me when we met the first time. I was tiny like Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio, he'd said. The name had stuck. Yeah, I'm okay, but can you come home, please? Anxiety bubbled in my chest. If he didn't come home, I would be left alone with Mama, and I did not want to be left alone with her like this. I could still hear her whimpering on the bed next to me, her back trembling as she cried quietly. Yeah, I'll come home. I'll be there in a little bit, okay? He sounded tired and more than a little sad. <sighs> okay. I took a deep breath, trusting that another grown-up would be there soon, but I wondered for a fleeting second if he would really come. In this moment, I realized that I would have to be the one to hold the pieces together. There was no one else. It was just me. I heard the soft click of the phone in my ear as Butch hung up, and I slowly set the receiver back on the phone. He's coming home, Mama. For some reason, this made Mama ball. Her face crumpled and the tears fell with abandon. I heard her breath wheeze between sobs. Maybe it came from the relief that Butch was coming home, or maybe it was relief knowing that someone else could take care of me while she finished her drunken breakdown. Maybe his coming for my sake because I'd asked and not because she had had hurt her feelings. Whatever the reason, she cried like a broken-hearted child. I let out the breath I hadn't realized I was holding. <sighs> I had no idea that in that single moment the trajectory of my life had forever changed with that single phone call. 
My role as my mother's keeper, as everyone's keeper, cemented itself in that brief moment in time. I would become the one people look to to take care of the hard things, to have the tough conversations, to take care of the details no one else wanted to deal with. I'd become the caretaker, the protector, the problem solver. I would become all of these things over a lifetime, but in that instant, I was a six-year-old child alone for the first time with a mother in distress. I didn't have the comfort and safety of my older siblings to help me or guide me. I was on my own and I felt very, very alone. So unsure of what to do next, I thought about what she would have done for me if I lay sprawled on my bed in my day clothes crying. I could do this. I'd keep her safe and I'd make her proud in one fell swoop. I walked to the end of the bed and I gently pulled off her shoes, dropping them to the floor with a thud. I tugged at the large fluffy bedspread covering the other half of the bed and draped it over her kissed her tenderly on the cheek, then smoothed her hair down again, whispering softly to her and to myself. Shh, Mama. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Thank you. She bursts through the front door of my new apartment, so excited to meet me, the newest addition to the house. Through the doorway, left wide open in her rush to shake my hand, hot afternoon sun floods into the dark living room where I've been caught unawares, about to demolish a plate of freshly microwaved pizza rolls, my stoner food of choice at the time. I crumple my single napkin between my hands, hoping this wafer-thin paper collects as much grease as it heroically can, just in time to catch her hand. As she pumps my, shol my shoulder socket in the most golden retriever-like handshake, I notice soft highlights in her hair, a wide-eyed smile with dimples. I could just be high, but backlit in that golden <laughs> summer heat, she's easily the most beautiful person I have ever seen. Her name is Chloe. Chloe and I become good roommates, even better friends. We spend that first summer commiserating over our very terrible ex-boyfriends, promising ourselves we're going to do better from now on. She's so confident in the way she holds herself, the way she takes care of her own, killer sense of humor. I'm in the middle of making one of our nightly Netflix binge snacks, tonight is grated parmesan over kimchi, um, <laughs> when I realize I've got a fat crush on this girl. Of course, it's only a hypothetical crush. Um, she's my roommate. And she's also, in her words, mostly straight. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not. Of the media representation that exists for queer folk, the process of coming out is one of the most commonly recurring tropes. I was never quite sure how I was supposed to do it, but I knew that it was going to be one single announcement a jump scare out from the closet, if you will. And um, I get to wear this badge, honorable bisexual. A brassy standard issue pin on my lapel, my swear in to the secret club that's gonna help me explain everything I need to know about my crushes on girls. Anyway, it's not news to my friends, including Chloe, those ultra progressive fucks. Um, one Saturday night, Amid thumping speakers and the chaos of 30-odd mutuals starting into a college apartment, I seize the perfect opportunity in a brief lull to announce, guys, I think I'm bi. They cheerfully clink their beers with mine. No worries. Actually, we've known for a while now. Thank God, you finally admitted it. I choke into my solo cup. How'd you know? <laughs> Six pairs of eyes rake me over before erupting in raucous laughter. Some more backpats, quick congratulations, a rambling slur toast an hour later, and that's that. For the very first time, I'm out to my friends. I had suspected very little might change, yet I don't expect to feel even more lost. This was supposed to tell me who I am not give me more anxiety about how to inhabit my newly self-anointed identity. Um, and as it turns out, as a queer Asian American, coming out was my most uneventful non-issue. Mm -hmm. A couple years pass after we move in. At this point, my secret crush on her is common knowledge to our friends. Then she gets a boyfriend, and according to her, he checks off everything on her list. He's tall, he knows my family, he's white, 
honestly, he tells the best jokes, on and on, that list goes. Chloe is passionately regaling details of her new boyfriend the next morning. I'm listening through bleary eyes. She really has so much to say about her new ideal man, but I've suddenly lost the ability to hear any more of the words falling out of her mouth. All I can think is, the only thing Evan has that I don't isn't the fact that he's a man, it's the fact that he's white. In the following weeks, wiping steam wands, hurrying to class, my fixation on this one word compulsively returns. I don't think she gave second thought to some preordained missive that her ideal partner would be a white man. After all, she'd said it straight to my face. Naturally, I start bargaining with myself to see what I could do to be white too. I have to know, is there anything I could do to put me into that category? What could I do to make Chloe's minimum requirements list? It's only a color, brown is close enough, and white people love getting tans. <laughs> so what could I do to make myself white? Is it marrying white? All my grandmother wanted for me was safety. Of course, in her very serious life lesson lectures, she meant that marrying a white man would offer me maximum security in a financial sense, or in the number of social ladder rungs I could jump. A white husband, two and a half kids and a dog in the suburbs, far away from the world of poverty, mass starvation, and wartime, I was brought here to escape. She wanted me to have the American dream. I wonder what she'd think if she knew I found um, a loophole. I could still honor her wishes and marry white. It would just be a white girl. Hope that's okay. Um, I'm nine years old when I proudly announced to a rowdy table of adults at a potluck that um, when I grow up, I'm going to be white American, not Chinese American. I'm fidgeting in my roller skates, confused by their abrupt silence when I expected praise. An auntie at the far end breaks the silence. She starts scoffing. Mei Mei, let's stay out of the sun for the next 10 years first. It took me so damn long to undo that yearning to have blonde hair, blue eyes. It took me so damn long to realize that when I suddenly become attractive to men, when I start receiving attention, hellos, friendly small talk from strange white men I'd never met, I'm only 10 when it starts. I am too young to understand that if I'm a point of attraction to them, it has nothing to do with me. It took me so damn long to realize that why boys are not the most desirable class of people to have attention bestowed upon me. I've spent years and doing my own internalized white supremacy, believing firmly, committing to solidarity, intersectionality, anti-colonialism, all the academic leftist buzzwords I thought would protect me. So damn long, and in the end, none of it prepared me for the shock of realizing that the white women I fell in love with could also still prioritize whiteness. Thank you. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. My parents were walking irritably around me like hungry flies. Their voices were loud and interfering, but at least they agreed on the idea for once. I was quietly walking around and listening to their unsavory mix of extravagant claims, copyrighted ideas and insults, but the dam inside was leaking. I was quiet, yet both could sense the unpleasant, ballsy and calculative villain in my eyes. It's been a while since he'd made an appearance. You tell me Fox News is bad. Where do you get your news from? I took a class in political science, as if that makes any difference. If you read a thousand books, you would still be missing a life of experience. Mom was in the bathroom, to the corner of our living room, releasing her menacing shouts. I haven't had breakfast and wasn't feeling like it anymore either. In fact, I would have thrown up if we had a better squeegee in our American dream house. <laughs> I know that if I started a rational argument to put my word against hers, neither of us would give up until our souls are filled with darkness and the walls could no more contain our screams. 
But I focused on the theory of constructed emotion instead. I imagined Lisa Feldman Barrett giving me her neuroscientific TED Talks with household-related examples. <laughs> I've paid attention in choosing journalists that are not funded by special interests, and I love to tell you where I get them from, Mom. She left her morning makeup, half done, and walked out of the bathroom towards me, but I continued. In fact, I've told you about them many times. You know their name and make fun of democracy now every time you catch me watching them in the morning. <laughs> she stands in front of me with a familiar menace in her eyes. It was as if I wasn't her son. A look one might give to a culprit right after a traffic crash. My mom is not crazy, just hurt and never loved enough to fully recover. A distraction. I was willing to give away my kingdom for a distraction. It's the same for us, too. Look at all these well-known political analyzers who are defending Trump. I glared at the screen that my dad was talking about, <clears throat> a political debate about the American election and journalism in BBC Persian. On one side, there was an educated Iranian female journalist, and on the other, this old, well-dressed, well-known political analyzer who believed Watergate shouldn't have been published by the press. The moment that female journalist started to talk, my dad used this piece of sensory information to back up his claims about Biden's corruption and my biased view. Look at the type of people they bring and allow on this show. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Even the BBC is biased. They're taking the side of mullahs and Biden. He was internally reassured enough to rest his case. Maybe it was the fact that he had not been sleeping with my mom for the past 10 years. Maybe it was the Iranian cult that drove his superstitious life philosophy, or it could also be that he'd left his family behind and now he only had the TV to come find them. Why did you tell him I haven't voted for Trump? If you could vote, you would have voted for him. Defend your opinion, don't let them say whatever they want to us said my mom, the, oppressive, the progressive branch of our internal Orwellian government, still addressing me indirectly when I'm right fucking here. The same way she addressed her life, with years of being ripped off of critical decisions, she learned to sit inert as the injustice of life revealed itself, and she'd soak it all in, not changing or fixing, not even having the desire to just singing her songs of defeat, more nuanced and heartbreaking year after year. My dad was fixated on the TV and didn't notice my mom. The woman on the TV was saying, but it's a matter of democracy not working. If the government is hiding a big secret that can't be scrutinized by checks and balances, then who is going to voice re in resistance to injustice? My dad shook his head in disappointment as he saw me agree with her. Here he was looking at that woman the way he did with my mom, a careless, condescending distance that he inadvertently seemed to practice. I wanted to explain how Trump is really not saving Iran. I wanted to point out that all my dad's actions and decisions have not made our lives or Iran any better over the past half a century. And Iranians in there are probably better off of his vicarious foreign views about their politics. But he wouldn't listen. Anybody, everyone knew by now. She and my dad had become a miniature version of the oppressive Islamic Republic that me and my brother had to fight all over again. My younger brother has been casually calling them Nazis for the past few days. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't so calm and obedient like me, and if he couldn't prove to be a lover, he was determined to be the villain. And so he joined the ever-shouting mentality of our broken bond. I left the house without a word, sat on my rusty brown bicycle and drove my usual route. I thought about everything, the many other instances of intolerance by parents who seem to think my forgiveness and respect is theirs by default. I hit a bump in my way which made me try to engage my rusty brakes only to realize that they are, all, are, they are of no use. People were walking their dogs and showcasing their colorful masks and I had forgotten mine. They looked at me curiously. The approaching stiff curve forced me to stand on my bike trust myself and exhort my weight against the gravity in a 75 degree balance. According to the neuroscience book I was reading at that time, the complicated motion of my bicycle was predicted by my brain eight milliseconds before I even perceived the curve. And now I was just to witness the accuracy of my dreams. 
<laughs> People halted their pets, wondering if the strange-looking, determined bicyclist was going to fall. The dam broke. It came out as a few unlikely tears on my eyes, blown across my cheeks with the wind of the uphill curve. I looked at the highway that rested beneath the overshadowing tree that, that, down that curved sunny street. My predictions were damn accurate. I should have come to their defense long ago. I thought of some lines to conclude my experience, and then I decided that they were a poem titled, I Am Myself Alone. I was the liberal Biden supporter whose radical views shouldn't be taken that seriously. But here I was, no, not so quiet and liberal anymore. I came inside and put a good ounce of the dankest pot in my grinder and with the utmost passion and attention grinded the crunchy goal away. My dad is slow at noticing things and my mom can attest for that. But he's a smart man, as smart as quick in computation and very bad at everything else. So he might have decided to keep quiet or completely missed my protest, but he finally stopped in his casual couch to fridge route and stared at me as I began rolling the joint on the living room dining table. He's doing it here now. <laughs> you do that? Address me directly, you coward. I thought, but kept rolling and waited for my mom to repeat one of her signature lines or curse phrases to back up my dad's fine observation. She didn't think much of it. She'd low-key been taking edibles from me the past few years as well, but... <laughs> But she dismisses me with a familiar chak to sarit, which in that context means fuck you. <laughs> she was covered behind a plastic leather sofa, her voice more internal, avoiding the tempest. I reviewed what they said as I spooned every last key from the folded dollar. You can't do it here. Not in our house. The more we compromise, you guys just get worse. Said that, the good that, kind that. I didn't look up from my careful rolling. The decision was made not eight milliseconds, but eight minutes ago. My adrenaline went up. My hands started to sweat. I was nearly done with the joint, and Richard turned to the audience under the spotlight. If you're going to pretend that your thoughts, your behavior, your words, and your vote have no effect on other people, on us, on each other, and of of our understanding of one another, then I'm going to do whatever I want to do as well. Do you think it's difficult to just shout, here I am, a satanist, anti-fascist, liptard, communist, faggot, sitting at your dinner table? You can accept me for who I am, or like your beloved Trump, throw me out of our house. I licked the edge of my joint and gave it a nice roll. It was <laughs> drenched in the floods of my palms, non-uniformly distributed and skewed, but it was all the boundary I could muster. A cloth for my naked villainy, a well-deserved nature's pat in the back, my only trophy. It's December of 2018, and I should be taking my finals. Instead, I'm staring through familiar metal bars in the backs of a police car. I can't believe that this is happening again. I'm a drug addict, and have been since I was 13. I did get clean for a while after I got out of high school, but in 2015, I started smoking crystal meth again when my grandpa passed away from congenital heart failure. All I wanted to do was not feel not care anymore about anything, and smoking mess certainly came through on those expectations, for a while at least. When I couldn't get high from smoking anymore, I started shooting up. The fucking needles. That's what literally took my addiction to a whole new level. I could not be without drugs, so I did anything to get them. I sold them. I robbed people. I made counterfeit money. It didn't matter. The fear of being without them was greater than the fear of whatever I had to do to get them. I'm not sure what made me this way, because before drugs, I was a kid like everyone else. Yeah, my family was slightly broken, but only a little. My mom and dad divorced when I was young, but I never went a day needing anything. I was well taken care of and well loved. 
I grew up modestly. I got presents every Christmas and birthday. My mom and dad are not drug addicts or criminals, just regular people. The final straw was a high-speed chase in a stolen vehicle. That little incident landed me nine months in jail. Not too long after being released, I started the cycle all over again. It was always the same. I meet old boyfriend. Boyfriend says he misses me. I try to stay clean and be with him. Boyfriend gets mad about such and such, then boom, I'm high again with all my chips on the table. My freedom, my future, and my clean time. When my probation officer pulls back into the booking building of Las Colinas, I know that I've lost that bet. It sucks being in jail, but I'm mostly mad at myself. If I had successfully completed my probation, it would have been grounds to dismiss my felonies. I wanted those felonies to be dropped because people with felonies can't work with the zoo. During the little time I'd been clean, I found my purpose. I worked at the San Diego Zoo with the Wildlife Conservancy. I learned about all the different projects that they fund to save different species like pandas, giraffes, or elephants. My job was to learn about these projects and share their stories with the guests of the zoo and let them know how a monthly donation could help save lives. That ignited something in me. I began to dream about becoming a part of those very projects I was telling everyone about. I wanted to save the elephants. Now I'm in this cold, uncomfortable, plastic back seat with cuffs crushing my hands. My probation officer is talking about terminating me. I could, I'm going to have a strike on my record, maybe even go to prison. For what? An abusive, toxic relationship and chasing a high would never be able to achieve. Soon I'm getting my county blues, my used underwear, two thin blankets that are unraveling because the girls use the string to thread their eyebrows, my welfare pack, which consists of a toothbrush, a comb, a bar of soap, a bottle of body wash that doubles as shampoo, a two-inch pencil, and an envelope with a stamp on it. I feel slightly relieved that I'm finally getting to go to my housing unit. I can finally do what I've been depriving my body of for who knows how, for who knows how long, sleep. I'm coming down off of my month-long high and I'm too exhausted to be or feel anything. Then the deputy pops my cell phone and shouts, Penny, visiting. I can't imagine who would want to visit me. I'm escorted out to the visiting building where I'm strip searched and then sent to sit at a table in the visiting room. My dad walks in and my heart sinks into my stomach. In a sudden moment of clarity, I'm aware of my face. I've been mutilating it by picking out imaginary zits. There's an abscess smack dab in the middle of my forehead. I'm strung out and I look it. I'm literally wearing my guilt on my face. I don't even have the strength to come up with a nice, well thought out junky lie as to why I'm here. My dad sits down at the table and says, hi baby doll, how are you holding up? He asked this simple question as if he was just sitting down for a cup of coffee and asking how finals were going. First, I'm angry, and then, just as quickly, I'm immensely sad. I'm mad because my dad can't or won't allow an image of his perfect daughter to be tainted with the place I'm in, and the only way to do that is to pretend it's, it isn't happening. But I'm sad for pretty much the same reason. Beyond my fucked up face, he sees the girl I once was that loved horses and bleached her hair in the fifth grade. Instantly, I wish I could take everything back to be that girl again. I just start sobbing, disgust disgustingly and uncontrollably. It's one of those ugly cries, the ones with the snot bubbles and everything. I don't think I've ever cried this much in my life until this minute. For the first time, I'm out of excuses. I'm no longer blaming anyone for my mistakes because there really is no one to blame for all of this but me. My dad has mastered a skill that I wish I could have right now. He can see beyond all of my shit beyond all of this massive mess I've made and see the me I don't even think I know anymore. All of these moments, missing finals, seeing my future going down the drain, seeing myself in the dull mirror of my cell with the totality of my drug abuse apparent on my face, and my dad's visit play over and over in my head. Who have I become? Am I really that girl that loves horses and grows up to want to save the animals one day? Or am I the bitch who robbed your house and sold drugs to your daughter just so I never had to feel what it's like to come down? I can't be both, and it's time to decide. I get back to my cell. For the first time in my life, I pray. 
So, God, I don't really know who you are or what you are, but I have to ask a favor. I need you to help me. I need to help stop being this person that I am. And I want to be someone that my family can be proud of. And I don't ever want to come back here again. I just want to change my life. Amen? Oddly, I feel this indescribable sense of commitment I've never experienced before. I don't even know what God is, really, and never really have. But I remember other times when I swore I would change and do better, but nothing ever did. But for some reason, this time feels different. I finally have my day in court, and my lawyer requests to merge all of my cases together so that all of my separate cases can be given the same sentence, which would mean less time in jail. But we won't have that decision until after the holidays. I'm going to be in jail for Christmas. I feel defeated. I walk back to the holding tank, chained to this lady who asked me what happened at my hearing. I tell her how I want to go home for the holidays. I tell her I feel like maybe God didn't hear me. She says, I was, back in, I was in prison back in 98 for attempted murder, and when I asked God to change my life and finally served my time, I got out and went to school. I wanted to be a nurse. Everyone said I couldn't do it, but God was on my side, and I believed I could. For the last 18 years, I've been a pediatric nurse at Rady Children's Hospital. The only reason I'm back here is because of my damn self, not God. God gave me the ability to do for myself what I never could before. And if you really want to change your life, God will never turn his back on you. A lot of women I have met in jail have said something similar to me before, but now I hear it differently. I think if she can do that, maybe I can still work with the animals and go back to the zoo. I just have to trust this process and be patient. At the end of January of 2019, I head into court one final time. As quickly as the hearing starts, it's over. My lawyer explains to me that I'm being accepted into a treatment, into treatment and all of my cases will be dismissed or reduced to a misdemeanor contingent on my successful completion of an intensive 18-month outpatient program called Drug Court. I'm cautiously optimistic about this presence of this God in my life. Everything I've asked God to help me with is coming true. Maybe if I continue to have faith, I'll be able to do something with my life. Over the course of the next 22 months, I test this theory. I trust in God and in the process of unpredictable recovery. And every time, the theory holds strong. Only when I start to doubt do things get out of control. I'm assigned a therapist. Every day, we all come to group that she facilitates. She asks us to, to describe the state of emotion we are in. Sad, happy, excited, embarrassed, and so on are considered emotions, whereas tired, mad, and bored were not. One day, I say, my name is Keela. My clean date is 12-14-18, and I feel forbearing today. <clears throat> my therapist kind of smiles and asks me to explain my definition of my emotion. I explain that I understand forbearance to mean to persistently endure. She likes it, but says maybe there's another way to look at it. She says, imagine yourself going up a steep hill at an angle with the rain falling hard in your face, but you put your arm and your best foot forward and continue to climb anyway. Although I liked my original definition, my therapist's definition is the one who, that stayed with me. I think of this definition even now. I've been given a gift through my experiences. I've discovered I have the power to persistently endure regardless of how hard the rain is coming down. The snow is coming down furiously as it swallows the open road. The sound of the white noise on the radio engulfs the car. I'm six years old, watching the snow fall, creating white blurs in the darkness with the faint silhouettes of the pine trees. Dead in the night, in the middle of nowhere, my mother grips the steering wheel as if her life depends on it and rocks steadily back and forth. She's focused, watching the road with a piercing stare as she murmurs something again and again. I listen to hear what she's saying. It's a prayer. I sense she's afraid, so fear consumes me. The conditions are horrendous and our small two-door Acura should not be on the road. 
With every curve and every turn, the slightest movement of the steering wheel, I can feel the car almost slip out of mom's control. I sit anxiously with sweaty palms and begin to call to God in my mind. I ask for his guidance. I ask for his protection. I ask, why is this happening? I ask, why did he make me like this? Why did he make me broken? And why did he put mom and I in this situation in the first place? It's my fault we're on the road in the middle of the night in whiteout conditions. It's my fault that we have to drive three hours away to this specialized hospital for kids with unique conditions like mine. All I can think is that it's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. I'm not sure if I believe in God. We were coming back from Shriners Hospital, an appointment I had earlier in the day for my right leg. I don't know what is wrong with me, all that I know is that I'm different. So I see specialized doctors to help me. My right leg aches from the shots of Botox I received to reduce tension and tightness of my muscles. I'm put into a cast molded at an angle of 90 degrees. Mom continues driving carefully, slowly while still praying. She looks at me and says, don't ever let anyone tell you that you're different. I sit and replay that sentence in my mind over and over until I finally nod off. Imagine you can only <clears throat> imagine you can only use one side of your body till its full potential. That is my life. When I was born there were complications. I had a stroke and it left me with slight paralysis on the right side of my body. From my foot to my arm to the joints and even my face. It's like the right side of my body lags. And being that, it, being that I was young, it was hard for me to comp comprehend what was going on. In my mind, nothing seemed wrong with me. Everything I did and how I did it was normal. It was around second or third grade, I began to notice things about my body compared to others that weren't normal. The way my right heel would never touch the ground or how my right arm would dangle awkwardly like a broken leaf of a dry plant. The first time I had visited Shriners was the moment of clarity about my uniqueness. I had no idea that it would become a, such a huge part of my childhood and adolescence. I traveled to Shriners every other week during the casting periods of my therapy. The goal was to get my heel to the ground and eventually get me able to walk flat footed. It was a long journey and a lot of sleepless nights for my parents and myself. But I come from a damn huge family. I am the sixth child of seven and family is everything to me. We were raised to respect our elders and treat everyone how we would like to be treated. My parents always reminded me that everyone has a story, which means that everybody has their own shit going on. I grew up in a small town called Pertola in the mountains of Northern California. The population is just under 2000, but that number is fading fast. Just like the shit you see in movies or read about, everyone knows everyone, there are no secrets. My graduating class was 24 kids, including me. And as far as I can remember, I didn't have any problems with my peers until I knew that I was different. Most of the kids I grew up with were with me from grade school to graduation. And fortunately, I didn't have to deal with too much bullshit from anyone, but there is always someone. Those assholes who aren't happy with themselves, so they attack the they have to attack people's flaws or imperfections to make themselves feel better about what's going on in their heads. Sometimes I would even get shit from my insecure friends. I have tough skin though. I always brushed it off and tried my best not to pay any mind to it, but eventually the words began to cut at me like a dull knife. It wore on my mentality and confidence in myself. The more I began to understand my condition, the more self-conscious I would get, constantly being uncomfortable in my own skin always paranoid of what other people would think of me. This feeling of angst that people will only see half of me. I was in and out of the hospital, consistently being told what I could or could not do in life due to my condition. And kids are horrible. I've witnessed it firsthand with the names I've been called, and I'm emotional. I've always had problems controlling my emotions and dealing with confrontation is hard for me. My older brothers would tease me for it. Today, I'm in an emotional wreck in Miss Wilson's fourth grade class. It's time to settle down and get ready for reading. Everyone is still hyper from lunch, but not me. I'm anxious, my hands sweaty, and my body aches from the tension. I'm hyper alert to my surroundings because I dread school after lunch. 
We switch classrooms and I have to see Kenny Kelly. I fucking hate Kenny Kelly. <laughs> During this part of the day, it's like my life is stuck on a loop. It feels as if every day starting at 1.30 p.m. is the same day and I'm living in this hell on earth. I'm a ticking time bomb waiting to explode and today my timer ran out. I hear that classroom door close. I hear the commotion of the other kids as I sit at my desk fidgeting with my pencil. Then I hear him take the seat behind me and it's always the same shit a different day. Hey retard, he would yell or some other variety of disgusting, demeaning words. He's such a dick. Some days I can zone him out, but others he'll become agitated with my capabilities of ignoring him. So he'll flick my ears, stab me with his pencil, snap rubber bands at me, or pinch my neck and back until I wince in pain. Today was slightly different. His weapon of choice was a flashlight. He probably stole it from some other poor kid that has to deal with this shit like I do. He whips the flashlight against the top of my head. It's a loud crack. This piercing sound rings in my ears and sharp pains sweep throughout my head. I'm scared shitless of him though, so I don't do anything. I pray Miss Wilson will. He hits me again, this time even harder. I'm paralyzed by fear and I can feel my face getting hot. I begin to profusely sweat from the anxiety. I feel everyone's eyes on me. It seems like the whole class is watching but Miss Wilson. The girl I sit next to and have a crush on says, knock it off Kenny, leave him alone. He replies, you're going to let a girl fight for you, you gimp, and slams the flashlight against my head again. Tears are falling from my face now, I'm shaking uncontrollably, and he hits me again. I think to myself, that's it, and I snap. Darkness encases my vision, and the next thing I see is red, a red liquid, it's dark in color. It's blood. Kenny is holding his nose, lying on his back, and I have the flashlight in my hand. I'm confused, and I can't tell if this feeling that I'm feeling is fear or anger, maybe a combination of both. The classroom is silent, not a single noise from anyone. Miss Wilson finally decides to get involved, but not how I expect her to. She sends me to the principal's office. I'm the one who's being punished, and why? Because I snapped? because I finally dug up enough courage to stand up for myself. I'm horrified thinking of what my parents are going to do or say, but deep down I have this sense of relief because now I know things will be different, better at school with Kenny Kelly. I get suspended for a week and to my surprise, my parents are not at all upset with me. A week later I return to school and my friends praise me. Although everyone has a different story coming from different backgrounds and cultures with varying values and morals everyone is equal i wish that were the case i've come to learn that life is too damn short to live in a state of constant fear i'm here i'm alive so go ahead and only choose to see half of me it doesn't bother me anymore Have you ever experienced the feeling of being an outsider? The feeling of being lost? For my entire life, I felt like I did not belong. Being both American and Filipino, I struggle with my identity. I feel like I don't fit perfectly into these two groups. I am stuck somewhere in between, but not balanced. I am in limbo between these two identities, and I cannot fully accept or embrace either of them. I am an outcast from both of the groups that make up my identity. Most of the time, I feel lost. Ever since I was a child, society has told me that I was Asian, but I did not always feel like I was Asian. I grew up in a predominantly white town, and I was forced to assimilate into Western society at a very young age. Sometimes I felt like I identified as white, but I didn't look white. I remember hating my features so much growing up as they were not the Western uh, beauty standard and it was seen as foreign or weird in Malibu. Even though I grew up with the white kids, I never really fit in. I was constantly reminded that I was different from the way that I looked to the food that I ate. I was being constantly made fun of for my different appearance, 
I had dark skin and a big nose. I obviously stood out in a crowd with my white friends and classmates. I was a laughing stock at school whenever I brought my traditional Filipino food for lunch. My classmates turned up their nose and made faces for bringing such weird food compared to their Lunchables and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I begged my mother to switch out my pork adobo for a Lunchables or even a kid's cuisine so that I could impress and feel validated by my classmates. At the end of the day, no matter how hard I tried to fit in with my classmates, I was still different from them. At the end of the day, I was not white. I was an outsider. I realized that I could never be fully assimilated. It was because of these experiences, I decided to become even more detached from my Filipino culture than I already was. It was so bad that it got to a point where I would start to put down my other Filipino brothers and sisters to get white validation. I'd even tell dog eating jokes. I tried to be the cool Asian, but little did I realize I was actually degrading myself and for what? To appease my white friends? I was so ashamed of my Filipino culture. I didn't want to be affiliated with what I deemed to be embarrassing. Who knew my childhood self could have so much self-hatred with their own identity? Soon this way of thinking began to slowly change for the better. Later on in life, I started to have different views. I began exploring and slowly started to accept my Asian identity. During my first year of high school, I moved to San Diego, which was way more diverse than Malibu. I started to make other Asian friends who gave me new perspectives on my Asian identity. They encouraged me to be proud of my Filipino background and uplift others in the Asian community. I began to speak out against racism towards Asians as well as other minority groups. Looking back, I realized how terrible my outlook used to be on the colonial ment outlook used to be and the colonial mentality that I used to be plagued with was slowly deconstructing itself. Being around my new friends, I realized that I should embrace my culture and not be ashamed of it. Even though I was Asian, I was not Asian enough. To some of the members of the Asian community, I was seen as whitewashed. I was seen as a tryhard, someone who abandoned his Filipino culture when he was young. I was too white to them. I did not grow up taking pride in my Filipino heritage the same way as these other kids, and I tried so hard to push my Filipino culture away, I didn't have much to hang on to. I couldn't speak or understand my native language. I knew very little about the customs and traditions of my culture, and I only knew the basic foods. It felt like I wasn't even Filipino at all. I just looked Filipino. These past couple of years, I have been struggling with my identity and balancing the two sides of them. I have been trying my best to deconstruct this colonial mentality that had been in my brain since the day I first moved to America. I try to uplift members in my community instead of put them down, as well as speak out against racism, against Asians and other minority groups. I also try to educate myself more on my own community and let others educate me as well. On the other hand, I take what I learn and I try to educate others. Although I'm trying my best to balance two identities, I always contemplate, am I American enough? Am I Asian enough? I try to tell myself that I am enough, but it'll take some time and a lot of work. I hope I am American enough. I hope I am not seen as a tryhard who abandoned his culture. I hope that one day I can balance both halves of my heritage and take pride in my multicultural identity. And we want to thank our coaches and mentors, Jake Arkey, Randy Ndaikusik, Delia Knight, Sunny Ray, Anthony Azarito, Betsy Morrow, and Victoria Le Leva. Woo! These are the names of our performers once again. We've got Matt, Keela, yeah. Charlotte, Bardia, Jimmy, yeah. Joey, Woo! and our other faculty mentor, Marie <laughs> Alfonsi. Thanks so much, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our show. Do do do. <laughs> <laughs>